it's awesome to be. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's awesome to be back in, in Kansas City. I uh, spent about eight, nine years uh, of my life flying in a, a week a month to work over at, well, I guess it's that way, uh, now Sun Life uh, uh, was Assurant uh, Employee Benefits at the time. So yeah, I, I built my lifetime Marriott status one night at a time at the Crown Center Sheridan. Uh, <laughs> is, uh, um, you stay at a hotel too long if you leave on Friday and they say you can just leave your stuff. Yeah, that, that's, that's a real thing. Um, I, I've been stupid lucky uh, uh, and privileged in my career to have a whole variety of roles. Uh, everything from leading some technology transformation at Assurance, M&A, uh, uh, at Primera Blue Cross up in Seattle. Yes, a healthcare insurance company, I will wear that. Um, uh, lucky to launch a line of business for them, the, the provider uh, uh, practice. So if you know SpiroCare, maybe here in the Kansas City area, we did a similar thing up there, um, and then got to be CIO for a while. Um, and now I'm over at uh, uh, VMware, um, now Broadcom, um, health insurance company to Broadcom. There's a joke there somewhere. Um, uh, where I currently work, uh, kind of a field CIO role. I mean, we've got this fancy executive value advisor title, but, but think of it as a field CIO, field CTO, really helping uh, leaders of various companies understand transformation and, and frankly help justify it, right? Help explain and, and carry that story up through their leadership to get the investment. And yes, right, I think back to Laura's <laughs> talk. Shiny tools, happy to sell them to you if you, if you want. But, more, but even more than the tools, how do you justify the time? How do you justify the distraction uh, uh, and the other thing? Um, when I'm not playing with uh, uh, VMware and, and other executives, uh, I'm a member of uh, the FIRST board. Uh, if you're not familiar with FIRST, uh, we spend a lot of time with kids all the way from elementary through high school, uh, introducing them to STEM um, across all kinds of, of diversity and, and uh, economic opportunities. Uh, this was uh, two weeks ago in Houston. Uh, this was the FIRST World Championships. Uh, 50,000 people, 54 countries, 19 languages. Uh, it's amazing. So happy to talk about ROI in the break, but I promise I will talk your ear off if you want to talk about robotics uh, uh, and kids and uh, uh, getting kids from Libya the opportunity to play with technology is kind of a fun thing. But that's not why we're here. Um, ROI. What makes it, like, why should, as a leader, I help you do this, right? And, and some of this, right, an ROI we can talk about millions of dollars of investments because we're going to go sign that, that AWS or that Google Cloud contract. But sometimes it's, I just need four hours a week to work on this to advance us, right? So when I talk about ROI, I'm not just talking about I want to go spend dollars, right? I'm talking about what is the return to allow me to have my time, right, to, to go do this? How can, can I help us, right? What makes the money worth it? What could we be doing instead, right, is a common question. And then kind of the quiet part from somebody who had one of those fancy C titles for a while, right? Does this risk my job? Does it help? And I, I, I say that kind of tongue in cheek. Um, we were talking about replacing a core claim system at Primera Blue Cross and talking with some vendors and, and consultants to help us do this. Um, I was in front of my board and the board said, hey, how long will it take, do you think, to replace this claim system? And my snarky but kind of serious response was two and a half CIOs, <laughs> right? Because it's changing every business process. It's touching every part of the company. And you may think this is a great idea now, board and, and, and CEO. Uh, uh, Jeff was his name. You may think this is a great idea and we're going to do all of this, but I promise this is a three-year slog. And about year two, you're going to be tired of it. Right, and, and so it's having those kind of conversations. Um, if you're looking to get permission or, or investment, again, whether that's time or dollars, from your manager, from your director, from your VP, from your insert title here, how does it help them personally? I know that sounds maybe a little manipulative, and, and frankly, it probably is, but how, how is it helping them, right? That, that can help get you over the, the bump as well. 
there's three key aspects to, to ROI, or again, justification, whatever you want to call it. Does it advance the company's objectives, right? And I don't just mean profit and loss, although that's a really, really, you know, good way to get, get investment, is if you can show how you can make more money. But sometimes it's, I want to be the digital healthcare company of the future. Well, I can get you digital capabilities out in the market faster than their competitor is definitely aligned with, with the, the objectives, right? Again, does it help financially? I think that's the easy one. I can save us money or I can make us money. And then does it advance our reputation? And uh, the example I like to use is, boy, probably 10 years ago, I'm, I'm guessing on that timeline, MetLife uh, in New York started hosting these DevOps kind of similar things to this, right? Hackathons, they would bring people together and all of that. And yes, they did it so they could learn, right? They could learn from other people and all of that. But it also helped really burnish their reputation, right? I, I don't know if you know this, but people don't wake up or, or graduate high school going, I can't wait to work for an insurance company. <laughs> Doesn't happen very often, right? But if you're MetLife and you're hosting these DevOps days and you're bringing in right, the, the clouderati of the time and all of that kind of stuff, and I'm a tech, you know, tech person that wants to really, this is what I want to go do. I want to go work in an organization that, that kind of lives and breathes this DevOps way. Suddenly, MetLife had more people applying than they had jobs, right, as opposed to where they were just trying to definitely find. So those are other reasons that, that you know, we, companies may choose to take on various things. Um, the company objective one, I, you know, I will say, also, with all of this, let me actually take one quick step back and say, with all of this, the amount of money or the amount of time, right? I'm going to go hire, I need to go hire a team of six, or I'm only going to work four hours, or I'm going to go sign a you know, million dollar contract or a couple thousand dollar contract. Wherever that level of, of approval is how I'd say to think about it, is the level of objectives you need to line up with, right? Meaning, if I'm going, going to sign a multi million dollar cloud contract, Boy, this better align with the absolute profit and loss, bottom line, right, the board set kind of strategic objectives. If I need a couple hours a week, if I'm trying to just get, you know, kind of support to let's go try this thing, pilot this thing, well, then I just really need to line up with my manager's objectives, right, or, or my director's objectives, or maybe my VP's objectives. So, so keep that in mind. Um, because I think sometimes it's really hard to say, well, I want to go do, take on this, uh, you know, go play with Honeycomb and, and this observability tool. How do I tie that to the companies like, you know, we want to serve more healthcare customers, right? So some of that can be a challenge, but you don't always have to go to that level, is my point. Maybe. So let's talk money, because at the end of the day, we can all talk about a lot of fun, nice things and culture and all of that, which are hugely important, uh, tremendously important. But the thing that will advance, you know, move the needle the most or get you the most support is about money. And this is, uh, maybe, there we go. Uh, as you start to look at the financial ROI, there are four key things you have to keep in mind if you want a second shot at this. Right? You can ignore all four of these rules and you will get your first ROI approved. Right? You, you, don't, you can lie about it. Right? You can make up the numbers and get it approved, but you'll never get another one. Right? So these four rules are key if you want to be able to do, right, right, be successful the first time and the second and third, et cetera. Right? Uh, integrity is everything. Like I said, you have to be incredibly honest uh, uh, with all of these. That doesn't mean you have to be 100% accurate, by the way. I find people like really get hung up on that, right? It's okay to say, I think it's this. Just make sure you say, I think it's this, and, and here are the four reasons why I think that, right? Maybe it'll prove out, maybe it won't, because some of this is a big guess. Um, show the positive and negative, right? I, if I do this, I can help us get you know, these features out three times faster, but it's going to cost us twice as much. That, that might be an okay trade-off, but you have to be honest about it, right? Keep it simple. Uh, uh, I, I almost reworded this. I would say keep it as simple as possible, right? So sometimes uh, you have to get in the weeds and, and uh, when you want to get into justifications and all of that. And then don't commit someone else. We'll, we'll talk about 
uh, uh, working with teams and peers, right? If, if you're in the ops side uh, uh, and you're partnering with security because you need their help to help with this ROI, as that ops leader, don't walk out and say, security can get rid of half their people if you do this, right? Because uh, you might actually get that approved, but that CFO or whoever is going to come back and go to security and say, okay, we approved this and said you could get rid of half your people, right? That, that's that's uh, uh, it's one real way to like burn your culture really quick. Um, this is an example of, of one I did recently, and, and the details aren't important. It, it's, it's about Tanzu and, and stuff like that. But what I'm trying to say is, uh, I know I just said keep it simple, and then I, I showed this. Um, <laughs> there, there's a little hypocrisy in that. Keep it as simple as possible. But what I would say is get into a spreadsheet and say, for example, today it takes us three hours to provision a cluster. If we do this project, we think it'll take an hour to provision this cluster, right? All the way through as much as possible. Looking at before and after. Again, positive and negative. Looking at effort, people's time, uh, uh, you know, things that can, you can free them up to do other things is a huge driver and a huge winner. I find people go into these ROIs just looking for, I can get rid of this licensing cost, I can get rid of this server cost, I can get rid of whatever it is, right? You will probably get more return and therefore more support by, or, or at least as much, if not more, by looking at, hey, we can do things faster. Or if, I, if we bring this in, I don't have to do this anymore so I can go do this other thing that, that is really important, right? So getting that kind of before and after, right? Time before, you know, time without Tanzu, time with Tanzu here. Again, it, it, this isn't about Tanzu at all, just an example of what we used. And then come up with an average salary figure, right? Now, this gets a weird conversation sometimes, right? I will admit, right? Um, I wish, to be honest, we all just put our salaries up on a board somewhere. I think that would solve a lot of problems from a, a, a equality and diversity and, and that kind of thing, but that's not the, the reality and the cultures we all live in. Um, so I would actually go to HR, right, or even a VP and say, look, is $110,000 an average number for ops, right, or developer, right, you know, whatever that is. And then you start to use that number. And then just make sure as you have these conversations and you have this advocacy that says, look, well, I, I think I'm going to save us this amount of money because, you know, what used to take me three hours of my time only takes me one, and that's based on X number of dollars, right? But getting that into dollars uh, kind of is the common language that everybody can speak about to, right? And when I say everybody, remember as a technician, right, if we're, if we're talking about an observability tool, you get it, your leadership gets it, but you need to go get the CFO or accounting to, to, to approve it, right? They don't know what observability is, they, they don't care, and I don't necessarily want them to, to care, right? I, I don't need them to care, but I need them to understand that this is, uh, uh, why it's worth it, right? You have to do the work, right? Some of that getting down, you know, to the, the interview questions and understanding if I'm in ops, how is this going to save a developer's time or how is this going to save security's time? You got to go have those meetings, right? I, I will say this is like a huge side benefit of this. We talk about solving people problems and getting them to talk. I have, in building ROIs myself, also working with other customers, getting those two or three people in the room and saying, man, how long does it take you to validate that, you know, that control, right? I mean that from an empathy, not, geez, why does that take you so long? No, like, how long does that, that take you, right? And that's where you get into these weird or, or interesting and, and really productive conversations of, well, it takes me five minutes to do that, but the way you all set this up, I have this work queue of like 500 of them, right? And you start to have these conversations. So yes, you're building an ROI. Hey, if I bring this, I can save you time, but you're also starting to build empathy across organizations, right? But doing this work is sometimes really, frankly, frustrating. It's like the paperwork nobody wants to do, right? I just want to go set up ephemeral environments. I just want to go do it. Right? But you're going to spend a couple weeks right, doing this. But the benefit you get out of that, the support you get out of it, 
being able to do it right, not as a shadow IT, not as a skunk works, but as a, a, a priority for the organization makes your life a lot easier. Um, hard versus soft, this is kind of a enterprisey leadership weirdness. Um, dollars. The idea that, you know, it used to take me three hours, it's now going to take me one hour, that's worth whatever, a couple hundred dollars, whatever the case may be, but, you know, times 40 weeks, that turns out to be real money, right? Going and saying, I'm going to save that time, make sure you understand culturally your organization. At first, that's a soft cost, right? That's saving us $400, but I'm going to go spend that $400 by doing something else. That's a soft cost. A hard cost is, I'm going to save that $400 because I'm going to exit the organization. I am going to come off the balance sheet. You will not have to pay my salary, right? And this is back to, like, don't sign up another team for a hard cut, right? Some organizations do not, and, and right, I'll tag them here, a number of CFOs, chief financial officers, will not count soft costs as benefits because it doesn't leave the, the, the balance sheet, right? Which is incredibly frustrating. Because it's like, no, 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 that, that frees us up to go do these 10 other things. So that's a real benefit. But I have been in the room where they've gone, hey, we agree that's a benefit, but you can't count that as a return on investment. So know your culture, know your organization. Um, if you do that, it just means you have gotta do more sales, right? Everybody's gotta be a salesperson uh, uh, in this discussion. Uh, you'll have to spend a lot of time saying, okay, but if we do these 10 other things, then maybe we can increase profit or whatever the case may be. Um, and again, if you sign up another team for hard costs, they're going to be expected to cut. If you sign yourself up, if you're a manager, if you're a VP and say, if I do this, I'm going to remove $300,000 of expense from the organization, it's like a credit card. You're going to have to pay the bill, right? Um, and, and look, laying off people sucks, <laughs> don't. But I, sometimes it is a thing that happens. I, I will you know, uh, uh, admit that, but be really careful about signing yourself up for it. Um, this is kind of an example output of an analysis, and this is really big numbers. Um, I probably should have used something that was smaller. But uh, um, this was for a, a large organization that was looking at, at one of our tools. Um, you know, the gross savings here, I will tell you, was almost all soft costs, right? There very little of this was like license takeout or servers or any of that kind of stuff. Um, hey, we think, you know, you'll be able to save 71 million. It's going to cost you 18 million, your net savings, right? ROI is fancy percentages of that kind of stuff. Payback period is, is the one I just really wanted to talk about that. How soon will you see that, right? Because you can get this savings, but it might take you a year, right, to put in that uh, um, platform, that shiny tool, to redo all the processes, um, you know, all of the kind of stuff. And again, I, I'm showing you millions of dollars. Th this is just as valuable if you're talking about thousands of dollars, too, right? It's, it's the pattern more than the numbers. It can save you all the money in the world, right? We can uh, uh, increase our profits. We can become a unicorn, all of this kind of fun stuff. The thing that's going to matter most is, is the corporate culture in this. What moves the folks that are approving it? Right? Again, is it ego? Are they going to be able to uh, uh, go on podcasts and talks and, and all of that kind of stuff? Right? Is it going to help them? A lot of what we talk about here, about pushing, you know, corporations forward or companies forward in the DevOps and the automation, especially your technology leaders, they may actually support it just for that reason, to be able to go, we were the first ones in the area to do this, right? Back to ephemeral environments. Right? We are the first insurance company to bring that up. I don't, I don't know, whatever the case may be, don't shy away from that, right? Feel free to make your, like, you know, stroke the ego of, of who that approver is. That's not a bad thing from that perspective. Sorry. Looking at my time, I'm going to get going. Um, are you doing this for you or the organization? Is it resume-driven development? Um, <laughs> look, it's a thing. It's not always a bad thing, but own it, right? But I will say, if you're doing it just for your resume and there's no ROI, you, like, and again, whether that's hours, time, people, whatever, 
uh, question whether or not you should be doing it, right? Might be a time to have a hobby as opposed to uh, uh, in there. Politics, it's a real thing. It can be an accelerant or it can be a brick wall. Uh, sometimes it's an accelerant into a brick wall, frankly. Um, know that world, right? I'll bring it back to what we've all been talking about. If you still have a culture that has friction between dev and ops, or between ops and security, or between all three, right, that can be a real challenge. I think I can save security time. Well, if you and security can't agree to have lunch, security does not want you to tell them how, you can save, how they can save time, right, even though it's a really good thing. So it's back to, right, what Laura started off with, a lot of time it's, it's people, right? I've been in a world where data science was separate from IT, um, and that created all sorts of weird frictions and, and, and things like that, right? This would save data science time or money, but it wouldn't save IT time and just weird things. This is more about just being aware of it, right, and, and working through it. Um, beyond raw cost justification, ooh, this turned out to be really small. Um, some things that are up here, right, are Boy, we can save money because uh, we're going to give you better security and reduce the cost of application breaches. You start to get into what I call cartoon numbers if you start talking about, I'm going to save the organization you know, $50 million just because in avoidance of a, a, of a security breach. Those can be really, really powerful because you can get into those cartoon numbers, right? You can get that accountant to sit up and go, wow, right? That board member to be very excited. And there are times where that is real, and you should not be afraid to use it when it's real. But make really sure that you can then support it later, right? Because you're going to go and you're going to get approval for this thing, whatever this is, this process. And you're going to say, right, with your ROI, here's, oh boy, 11-month payback period, 275%, and I'm going to save us $50 million. Step two is they then want you to show that, right, that you actually did that, right, to, to, to get it. So um, I, I'll be honest, in, in the ROIs I do with customers, more times than not, I skip this part, or we'll have the conversation, and we'll kind of have the numbers with whoever I'm working with, that VP or whatever I'm working with, or manager, but we generally don't show it higher, because it's just, it's really hard to show in the back end. So, you know, I think unless you're talking about a security tool, right, or an observability tool that you can say, hey, this will let us right, detect anomalies before they happen and our apps won't go down as much, that kind of thing. Um, it, it's an area of opportunity, but use it with caution, if that makes some sense. Um, how does the project affect the business outside of technology? I talked about the, the claims system, right? If you are impacting business processes, make sure they are at the table for the ROI. Right? That might be a good thing, right? I'm going to save the call center X number of calls, X number of time, right? The, the claims adjudicators can adjudicate a claim in 30 seconds instead of five minutes. That's all really helpful, but you also then have to know the impact, right? Changing the business processes of everybody in the company is huge and disruptive, and you get the, right, the person in the, in, the, in the call center who is so amazing at their job but doesn't understand why IT keeps changing where that button is every three months, right? That's a real thing. So make sure you're aware of that, because when you go for that approval, if you're going for that bigger approval, yes, you need the CFO to approve, yes, you need the CEO to approve, but that COO that just has to run the business day to day also is gonna wanna cut at that. Right? Um, I already talked about this. The, the, this is really my point of looking at the security breaches and that kind of stuff. It's really the fastest way to approval because you get into, just like I said, cartoon numbers, uh, but then you have to prove it when you deliver it. Talking about prove it, how do you do that? So you've got approval for this thing. Let's say it was a six-month project. You got the, you did it, right? Eph ephemeral environments are up and all of that. Well, now that CFO is going to come back and say, hey, we agreed to spend, you know, that $500,000 you said we'd save a million, did we get it? The best way to do that is to go back in that exact same process of when you started, right? So it's doing the paperwork again, which isn't the most fun thing, but it, but it is important, right? And going back and having those same meetings and say, hey, it used to take us three hours to provision this cluster. We thought it would take an hour. Does it? 
Sometimes it'll be great. It'll only take us a half hour. Sometimes we thought it would take an hour, but it takes us an hour and a half or two hours. And sometimes it just didn't materialize. It still takes us three hours because while we brought in this tool or we changed this process, boy, we just, nobody thought about this thing that happened down the road. Be honest. Anybody that tells you every ROI is achieved is doing nothing but lying to you, right? I have been a part of 20, $30 million projects that we thought would return 200, 250 million dollars and they either didn't return anything or we never got them completed. Like that happens. I'm still here, we didn't get fired, right? Um, again, that's, that's like not okay, right? But there's usually gonna be a whole lot of learning that comes out of that as well. But I'm back to that integrity. If you want another you know, bite at the apple, if you want to right, have a follow-up project to improve that, or you know, your project was successful, you have to be honest. But be honest and claim your victories. Yeah, we thought it would take us three hours and it's now an hour. Look at that, isn't that awesome? Well, we thought this other piece would go from a week to a day, eh, it's still four days. Own that, right, that, that's a part of it. ROIs are a guess, educated guess, hopefully a really educated guess, but they're a guess. Maybe, and that's it.